Welcome to the Digital Marketing Victories Podcast, a monthly show where we celebrate and learn from the change makers in digital marketing. I'm personally obsessed with how digital marketers sell through and get their ideas executed. I'm your host, Catherine Watsia Ong. I'm the owner of WO Strategies LLC. We focus on organic discovery for our enterprise clients with a training centered approach. So today we're joined by Patrick Frank. Patrick is an author, consultant, principal of Patch Bay Media, it's award winning remote video production company. Patrick has also got a new book. It's called Zoom Out, the Video First Playbook. This book introduces readers to new platforms and strategies to connect more effectively with other people online. I think this episode is going to be perfect for you if you've ever wondered how to sell through your ideas effectively by using video and avoiding Zoom meetings. If you're curious about what video tools might be on the market and other ones that you might need to have on your radar, if you want to support this new kind of different asynchronous way of working by leveraging video to educate and persuade other people. So he's also going to share with us his take on the future of meetings and events. Without further ado, here's our interview with Patrick Frank. Patrick, thanks for agreeing to be on my podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. Can you tell us a little bit more about you and your background? Sure. So uh, my name is Patrick. I live outside of Washington, D.C. And since 2013, I've been running a small video production company, mainly working with nonprofits in the Washington area. Here we have lots of nonprofits, associations, things like that. I'm I, really a specialty in the education niche. So um, universities and, and education focused nonprofits, things like that. And um, 2020 lockdowns and literally like illegal for me to film anything and so as my cameras were stuck in their cases people still needed videos done and so my clients started reaching out like hey like we need a video for this we need a video for that what are we going to do how are we going to do it and we had been exploring kind of like more productized video models like doing some animation doing some user generated content you know mainly stock graphics and b-roll and things like that that we had access to and, and like can we make compelling videos without filming anything and so we had been kind of testing this out and, and had a little bit of success. But then when it became like required to do that, um, that's when we really doubled down and, and tried to make a couple formats work. And so uh, in May of 2020, we launched editvideocalls.com for people to send us their long form content, whether that's uh, something formal like a webinar or a podcast episode or something informal, like just a, a call with a client or a team member or something like that. And our team will go through will find shareable moments and produce them into a custom template that people can share on LinkedIn, embed on their website, things like that. And so as I was exploring all these new ways of making videos, I kind of got this idea of like, wow, like I got to share some of this stuff. There's all this explosion of video platforms now. We don't have to just use Zoom anymore. And so that's really where the impetus for the book came from was I just wanted to share kind of all this stuff I was learning about how to beat Zoom fatigue. What are these new platforms that are coming out that are really exciting and allow people to connect in more delightful, more personable, more uh, efficient ways. And, um, and so that's where I'm at now. So I'm, I'm doing some coaching and consulting around some of these ideas with some larger companies around virtual events and presentations and using video. Um, I, I kind of talk about how, how do you become a video first business? And really there's opportunities everywhere to add video, whether it's in your sales and marketing, whether it's in your training and onboarding, um, there's just ways where you can use video uh, super effectively to drive sales, to um, have staff, you cut down on staff training time and things like that. Um, so in addition to your, your typical uses of video, um, there's a lot of stuff you can do behind the scenes where video is really effective. Um, have there been any interesting video usages in, in digital marketing campaigns that you can share with the audience? So I'll be honest, like I'm, I'm definitely more focused on the sales kind of side, like mm. more of like the hand to hand combat, if you will. Um, and but I, I'll kind of share an example of something that I really like. And, and maybe there's uh, a, a more broader kind of marketing kind of takeaway here. But there's a really cool platform called Bonjoro, B-O-N-J-O-R-O. -O. And um, Bonjoro is one of a couple of these kind of like personal video platforms. So what you could do is you can set up a Zapier to say, OK, every time someone signs up for something, Every time someone like, you know, downloads an ebook or buys a course or something like that, um, Bonjoro will prompt you to record a short video, 
kind of thanking them, introducing yourself, welcoming them, whatever it might be. And so imagine if you signed up for something, let's say you paid a hundred bucks for a course and all of a sudden that course creator is sending you a 30 second video as they're walking their dog and they're just like, Hey, just saw you sign up for the course. Thanks so much. Like, I hope you learned a lot. Be, be sure to reach out if you need anything. I'm here for you and I hope you get a lot of use out of it and I'm excited to have you go through this course. So now like what kind of a great interaction is that, you know? So now you're totally bought into this course, this person. Uh, so that's a real simple way to uh, be able to utilize video in a way that you might not have thought about. That's cool. Actually, I haven't seen that yet on the marketplace. I yeah. obviously sign up to a variety of email newsletters to see what other marketers are doing, but I haven't seen that yet. Exactly. <laughs> um, so can you tell me a little bit more about the consulting practice and the editing um, offering that you've got and how that might be leveraged by marketers? Yeah, definitely. So I, I think one of the things that, that we're trying to do is just to cut down on meeting time within a company, right? So for instance, one project we're working on now is we're doing asynchronous all staff meetings. So now instead of having everybody come in for that hour, two hours, whatever, sit through a couple presentations, well, can we break this up into several 20 minute videos or even shorter that people can watch on their own time that can be really tightly edited? Uh, and so I think that that's, that's kind of one trend I'm seeing is just being able to take these large meetings that were um, always kind of mandatory and be able to deliver that in an asynchronous fashion that people can work on on their own. So that's that's one way. Uh, and then just I, I think presentations, I just think we need we got to stop using so much PowerPoint. There are really great tools out here um, in the virtual camera space, if you've heard that term before. Basically, uh, it's software that replaces your camera inside of Zoom or any other meeting uh, Google Meet or, or any other kind of platform that you're using. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to have your face next to your content. So you build slides um, where your face, you don't have to choose between whether I'm going to present with my face or I'm going to present with my slides. It's all the same thing. Um, and it's really engaging and really immersive and you can do a lot with it. So the two platforms I like here are Prezi Video and this app called mm -hmm, M M H M M, <laughs> uh, which is really fun. And, and so it's so, like an add on to zoom you pay for it extra or it's just an app. N yeah. You, you pay for it separately. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. They have, uh, some trials and some, some, it's like a, they're both freemium. Mm -hmm. Um, but they just allow you to, uh, create a presentation around your face. Like your face is part of it. And then you basically just tell zoom or whatever, like, Hey, Prezi is my camera mm -hmm, is my camera. And then you kind of have both windows side by side and you can go through your slides that way. Um, Very cool. show on zoom. Yeah. Um, so going back to the asynchronous meeting, I just keep thinking like if I was the senior exec that I would want to make sure that, um, yeah. If I, so if I was a senior exec, I would want to make sure that everybody actually watched the video. <laughs> so, you know, the whole idea of putting butts in seats is that in theory they're listening and they absorbed whatever the important corporate message is or change or HR policy or whatever. So are you, do you have some sense of how people are tracking views on this in any sort of way? How do they know uh, people I'm, have actually absorbed it or maybe not absorbed it? Cause you can't measure that, but like at least watched it. Right. So, I mean, I, I would say, I would argue that, like, do you know that anybody's listening or paying attention that much if they're there live, right? Right. They have yeah. their camera off, they're out for a walk. Like, you know, how much retention is there if, if you want to kind of compare apples to apples? Uh, so, look, I would just say that, um, you know, and, and I don't know if you, how you're going to like quiz your team or anything like that. Um, I guess my point is just if we can just try to make this more engaging, give people a reason to be there, whether it's live and they're doing something with virtual cameras, like I just explained, or they can deliver it asynchronously. Um, in a tightly edited package broken up into several different videos that, that kind of have just like, you know, what is the act exact, exact need to know, um, stuff for this meeting. Uh, I think that that's, that's going to drive people to actually engage with the content, understand what's going on and what the priorities are for the company. Another way that marketers can start using some of this material, whether it be asynchronous meetings or some of these virtual cameras is just sharing clips, right? If you have an all staff meeting, I think that there's going to be some portion of that, that your customers that your clients that people would be interested in that you'd want to share out. So it doesn't have to be the whole thing. Um, but if you think about like investor calls and things like that, sharing publicly what's going on behind the scenes, that could be an interesting tool for marketers to use. There's an app called super normal, which allows you to record a meeting live. And then there's literally a highlight button. And so as the meeting's going on, you can be just clicking highlight, 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 and then it'll, 
pull out all of those segments from that call so that you can easily share that one minute, two minute, 30 second piece um, out to your social media to include it in a blog post maybe. You can just embed a video in that blog post and you can promote that via your newsletter, something like that. So that gives marketers an idea. You're not scripting anything. You're not filming anything with real cameras, but you're creating video content from some of these things. Everyone likes to pull back the curtain peel back the curtain. Uh, and so I think that that could be an interesting thing for marketers to try. I wonder if you could also use that if you're, say you've got a longer webinar and you want to chunk it into a, like a e-course, whether or not that would be an easier yeah. way to sort of chunk into smaller videos and send it out. I think that's the whole name of the game, right? It's like, yeah, you, you have these webinars and you hope that you get some audience participation with those. Cause otherwise like why bother it's going live, right? And so I think that that's kind of the name of the game there with webinars is just to, to give people a reason to go live. Um, and then exactly right. Now you have this hour long, this 90 minutes, chunk that into smaller shareable pieces. There's another platform called Milk Video I really like for this, for webinars specifically. Uh, and they do a really good job of, of giving a really easy browser based tool where you can create those clips, fix the transcript, um, push it into a branded template and get it out. It's really cool. Oh, I'm totally gonna have to check that out. Um, so how can marketers get started in learning more about this uh, video, either learning from you or getting started with their video strategy? Do you have any sense of, say like they're in a business that's just not really using video at all. So how do you think they should wrap their head around it and get started? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, obviously the best way to get started is just to make a video. Uh, and so one of my kind of favorite starting points now is that um, if I'm sitting, if I'm going to reply to an email, like, let's say I get a, re a referral comes in, Hey, someone told me that you're awesome at making videos. I need to make a video for X, Y, Z. Can you help? So instead of writing this long email that says, yes, we can help you. And here's why we're qualified. And here's some examples, blah, blah, blah. I just hit record on a loom and I just reply back and just say, hi, thanks so much for reaching out. Uh, I took a look at your website. I saw that you had this and this, I have some ideas that we could do X, Y, Z. Let me know when it's a good time to chat. It's a 30 second, 60 second video, but now they are introduced to my personality. They show, I've shown that I cared because I took a look at their website or whatever it might be, gave them some ideas. So I'm invested uh, and it was really fast to do, right? I didn't have to, again, this isn't like setting up cameras, writing scripts or anything. It's just real natural. It's just a real, I think this is kind of the new name of the game here is to be able to use more video as opposed to emails and texts and things like that. Um, this comes especially in handy when how many times you've been on email where it's like, see my replies in bold, see my replies in blue, that sort of idea, right? Now you can just send videos back and forth. Hey, saw what you wrote. Here's what I'm thinking, X, Y, Z. You know, maybe you can do a screen share where you have, um, again, either like a website or a, a slide deck or something up there where you can kind of comment on each item. Uh, I think it's just a way more natural way of communicating than some of these forced things that we've done before with email and other medium. I'm always really surprised at, uh, the fact that, cause with some of the stuff that I do, especially if I'm using like a subcontractor for something, maybe I need to actually show my screen. Um, and I'm always really surprised that people don't realize that you have, um, you know, a game recorder built into, if you're on a PC, you have a game recorder built in, you don't even have to go get software. You literally can just turn it on, plug in your microphone <laughs> and, you know, and follow the cursor and start talking. I mean, it doesn't have your face, but it's just a very quick way of doing a screen share and you don't have to go find a whatever Chrome plugin software, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That you know? works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mac has it too. So with Mac, it'll record your screen. I don't think it'll do the audio. Uh, maybe it does do the audio. Yeah. I think it does. So quick time on Mac also is able to do this. It's not as shareable, not as immediately shareable. Loom's yeah. great. Cause as soon as you hit stop, it like sends you to the browser. Hey, here's the link. You can trim it. You can do some extra stuff with it, which you wouldn't yeah. be able to do if you were just recording natively on your computer with QuickTime or on windows. But, uh, yeah, I think this is the easiest way to get started where just turn your camera, like turn your webcam on, uh, say hi, tell people what this video is about, why you're sending it, record for 30 seconds or 60 seconds, send it off. That person can watch it on their own time. They can watch it at 2x speed. They can share it with somebody else. That's another really good use for this stuff. And I think that that's one of the, the things about meetings is like, if we had 15 people in this meeting before, how many people are actually going to participate? Probably only three or four. So now those other 10 people, we can just send them the link we can highlight certain portions for them that are just relevant to them kind of using that highlight tool that I, um, talked about earlier. So I think it's, it's just all about, uh, being more deliberate about these 
communications and how we're working with our team and our clients. So um, I've got maybe a tough question for you. Uh, it seems like so we're both extroverts <laughs> and uh, I believe you've Just spoken a little. a little bit, right? So both of us have spoken, you know, in front of people, but not a big deal, but uh, I think we're the minority to be honest. And so how do you get people more comfortable with off the cuff, turn on video camera, record something if that's not their jam and they're, you know, and public speaking seems very frightening because I, what I'm hearing is that with asynchronous work, it could be really much more effective to send a video with your face than an email. Uh, and we're moving in that direction, which means more people probably should get comfortable with this medium. So any, any tips for the wallflower that doesn't really yeah, want to turn on I the mean, video? I would kind of say, you know, uh, I don't think your face is extremely necessary with, with any of the things that we kind of talked about. Like at the, at the bare minimum, you need audio, right? Just talk, uh, you know, and, and I think iMessage is great for that where you can record short audio messages, Facebook Messenger, something else I use, you know, and a lot of times it's just quicker to just like talk than it is to type out long things. Um, and then I think again, like you kind of brought it up too, the screen share thing is huge, right? If you can just show somebody what you're expecting from them, you have a question, just show them what you're looking for. It makes it really easy for them to reply as opposed to trying to like explain it in text. Um, so I, I think, and there are some people that obviously are, are more comfortable writing or better writers. Uh, and so I think, it just comes down to what what is the quickest way for you to get your message across and to be able to receive a response. So uh, if some people prefer writing and then I prefer sending a video back or vice versa, um, you know, like we can just accommodate a lot more preferences this way. Uh, and, and I got like my, my big thing is like I just I think it's all about speed. I think it's all about just being able to deliver that message effectively as quickly as possible is video or at the very least a screen share or something like that. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. So, uh, tell me a little bit more about your book. So what prompted you to write it? Who do you think, uh, the audience is? what do you think they're going to get out of it? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, again, as I was kind of working through these issues of not being able to do the traditional video route and, um, was being, but still, producing really effective videos, uh, especially for virtual events and things like that. Um, and I just kind of wanted to share a little bit of my experience on, on the tools, how we were making these videos, what the steps were. Uh, and again, bringing into it some of these meeting strategies and, and things like that. And so really the book kind of goes through kind of a, a little bit of the history of a video conferencing technology. Um, then we kind of go into um, meetings and effective communication. Then we talk about uh, video first presentations with the virtual cameras and virtual events, kind of what are some of the ways to set up uh, successful virtual events, virtual conferences. Uh, and I think there, and, and, and this is something that's not gonna go away, the virtual event. I think that as things open up more, as we get out of this pandemic at whatever point that happens, um, there will continue to be that virtual component to every event um, because there's just, there's just so much opportunity to have that accessibility, have people from all around the world attend these events. And the opportunity is there for a smaller, more intimate in-person experience for VIPs, for those investors, uh, for the people that, that need to be there in person. I don't know how many conferences you've been to, but you know, I would go just cause like my company was like, Hey, go to this, go to this conference for us or something like that. And you just kind of walk around and you're like, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know who to talk to. Like, yeah, the stage stuff is great. You learn some stuff. But it's really hard to like, you know, if I see someone walk, just sitting over there, I mean, am I gonna go up to them and just kind of like strike a random conversation? Whereas in a virtual event, I can hover over their face. I can see their name, I can see their LinkedIn mm -hmm. page, I can see who they work for. We may have even uh, listed a few interests that we have in common. So as soon as I message them, I know I have an in, like, hey, I saw you're interested in this, me too, would love to learn more about what you're working on. You know, that's the better way than like having to strike up a conversation with a random person at a conference. So I may be an extrovert, but I'm not like a crazy, like just go up to anybody and talk to them. I think most people can identify with that. So I think that's really the, the experience that we need to deliver with these virtual events. Um, it's just creating better conversations because we just have so much more knowledge. It's, you know, it's kind of like a blind date versus a match.com or something like that, right? You know, a friend sets you up, it's a friend of a friend and so like, you think, okay, like this, 
this this could go well, right? I, we have like two degrees of separation. Um, but I would think a lot of times that match.com is better because you just know so much more about that person going into it. So um, I think that's kind of the analogy there. Uh, and so finally then towards the end of the book, we're just kind of talking about more, uh, I call it like, a, like the video, your video first life, right? Uh, talking about video and education and video and healthcare. And so, um, you know, I think really like, the the, uh, the pandemic really exploded all of these opportunities for video and a lot of stuff we like, we had all these tools before we just weren't using them to their fullest extent and so what does that fullest extent look like and kind of what does the next ten years look like um, using video tools and strategies? Well, I will tell you that I'm the extrovert that had gotten that sort of uh, knack from my dad of walking up to complete random stranger. I I I'll be at a conference and if it looks like somebody's looking a little down and a little lonely, sometimes I literally will go up to them, strike up some random conversation. Um, but I will tell you that the the success rate of connecting with them on something you have in common is low. <laughs> I might cheer yeah. them up because they got somebody to chit chat with them, but, um, sometimes it's worked. I think I got a client out of it once out of all the shows I've gone to. Um, but most of the time it's a bomb. <laughs> so if it makes you feel yeah. any better. <laughs> well, that's all. I actually really like that, that strategy of like, yeah, find the person who's down and make their day. Like, that's really yeah. nice. That's a really cool way. They, to they just it. And, strike me as lonely. And so I wander over and yeah. chat with them. That's nice. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause then it, that, it doesn't feel as awkward. <laughs> I don't Absolutely. know. <laughs> um, I also really hope that virtual events don't go away. I got a chance to speak at Brighton SEO, which is the biggest UK search conference. No way would I've been able to fly over there and speak at that show in person. Oh yeah. You know, so great. It, the amount of like, I don't know, kid logistics with babysitting or whatever, in order to go to that show, plus the travel, I just, it probably wouldn't have happened. So I'm pro virtual events for sure. That's awesome. Yeah. And I um, think they probably had more sessions. They had more speakers. And that's the thing, like, because you don't have to travel, you can do more speaking engagements. You can do two or three things in a day when before mm -hmm. it's like that one event may have taken your entire week, may have taken three days. Uh, yeah. So, but that on, on the flip side, there's just more competition, right? For speakers. So your content has to be good. Your presentation skills have to be good. Your, your setup with, within your home office or whatever it is you're filming. Um, you got to be on, you got to be able to engage the audience. So that's really the opportunity for people who it's, it's a totally different game than being on stage, uh, virtual speakers. I, I kind of talk about it as like, you have to think like a DJ, right? Think about a DJ you went to at a wedding or something, right? Re reading the room, playing songs on the fly, using all of the hardware and software. Uh, and I think that that's really what speakers need to do, right? It doesn't, there's, there's not even an expectation that everything needs to be live. Like you could cut to a video, you could go for a poll, you could, uh, pull someone out of the audience and talk to them. Uh, and so I think having all of these tools at your disposal, instead of just like going through your slides in order for an hour, that's really how we can deliver better presentations. What kind of resources do you have in that regard for somebody who wants to up their virtual speaking game? Yeah, I would say the first thing is to start with the virtual cameras. So check out Prezi, go to Prezi.com slash video and mm-hmm.app, M-M-H-M-M. -M -M. Uh, and I think these are really great ways to start being able to deliver. Just like I said, I think the, the big thing is just getting rid of PowerPoint. I think everyone's done with PowerPoint. You're either reading your slides or they're you know not well designed or like, you know, it's, it's the face is a magnet, right? And so when you go full screen on your slides and your head is just tiny in the corner, it's really hard to engage with people that way, I think. Uh, and so if we can use more native video presentation software like these virtual cameras, I think that's a great place to start. Cool. Um, so you mentioned in your book that you think video could be really persuasive. You're also um, kind of negative on zoom meetings a little bit, which is ironic since we're recording on zoom, but anyway, um, <laughs> you, uh, you ultimately think that video could be used to build trust. So can you tell me a little bit more how you think marketers could do that, particularly how to persuade, I'm trying to think of the scenario. So you've got a scenario where you are an agency and you need to persuade your client or you're on a team and you need to persuade another, uh, another team to execute something. How do you think video would be able to help you with some of that? Or maybe present to your yeah, CEO definitely. if we're all remote, right? So sometimes you have yeah. to do a C-level presentation. What I would do is I would take the last five to 10 minutes of whatever call I'm on and I would 
ask a couple questions to get a testimonial essentially. So let's, we well, can use the client conversation. Um, so let's say like you're finishing up a project and you know, this is like a wrap up call or like you're almost done, something like that. Because, hey, I'd love to ask you a couple questions about how this engagement has gone, you know, and you, you just roll it, like start with four or five questions. You know, first question you can start with is what was the problem? You know, uh, why did you come to us? Why did you hire us? And then how has working with us been? And if you're at the end of an engagement or, you know, maybe if there's a couple weeks or a couple months that have passed, you can have some measurable results. Those are great questions to answer too. And now you can just clip that five or 10 minute segment, maybe clean it up a little bit. And now you have a really great testimonial video you can put on your website that you can share around when you're doing um, different prospecting in, uh, activities and things like that. So how do you vet that, the permission with your client yep. to use so that? Like, so just, upfront, do you have something in your, I don't know, contract or something that talks about recording all this video? Yeah. So I would, um, you could just informally like, Hey, we have a call tomorrow. Hey, at the end of the call, would you mind if, if I recorded a, a quick conversation just about this project that we've been working on? I would love to feature you to our uh, future clients of ours just to talk about how awesome you are and how great this project has gone. Cause it's great marketing for them too, right? If everyone's in a similar field, you're working with similar clients. Um, you know, who, who wouldn't want to be featured in a way that, that shows that they're a successful company that had this, uh, this campaign that, that went off really well. Um, so I, I think a testimonial video that you can just record at the end of uh, a call you're already having, it's a really good way to get started there. Um, so I also work with personally work with some, uh, clients that are, that have heavily technical information. Just wondering if you've ever come across executing videos from that kind of stuff and whether or not you have any best practices about what might work best. In particular, I was thinking I was at a presentation at one of the conferences and I want to, want to say it was SAIC or SAP, one of the big consulting firms. Anyway, they had taken all of their white papers that were C-level and created podcasts out of them with a professional voice actor. And they got way more uptake in actually reading the white papers or absorbing the information than reading yeah. the thing. Um, so I just kind of curious, cause I, my, yeah, my folks tend to, they like to talk about journal articles or, you know, it's a presentation <laughs> and a webinar and it seems a little long, <laughs> et cetera. Just sure. wondering if you've ever run across, uh, using video in those elements more. Yeah, definitely. So as I mentioned, we've been working with nonprofits mainly for the last almost 10 years. And all, you know, nonprofits have annual reports. They have their own research papers that they produce and things like that that get you know, funded by the Target Foundation or something like that. Uh, and those are 50, 100 pages, dense, very niche audience. And so what we've done is we've created you know, trailers almost for these longer reports. So, you know, if you can just do a 90 second video with maybe some high level findings that invites people to come read the whole thing. First of all, it makes them aware that this report exists. That's the first thing is, you know, how are, how is anybody gonna know about this report that's, that's being launched? Um, but also just is able to give some insight. So for instance, we worked with um, uh, an education nonprofit about high school dropouts and so, they had done a whole lot of focus groups and market research about kids, uh, young people, you know, from late teens to early twenties who had dropped out of school and what were some of the reasons. And so they had this big report about that. So we flew around and we interviewed, um, all these students. This was, you know, back in 2014, 15, something like that. Um, and, and so it was really cool to be able to kind of humanize that data to kind of be able to put a face to it. Cause when you're just looking at stats and stuff, and, and graphs and kind of reading executive summaries, like you forget that they're like actual kids that we're talking about here. And so having this accompanying documentary piece to go along with the report was really impactful. And, and uh, they're able to play it at events, they're able to talk about the work that they've done. And then of course, for anyone who's interested in, in doing a deep dive, that full report is there for them to crush, so. Have you ever, um, so I've spent a little bit of time working on user feedback for our websites. And I would think our listeners would be focused on that and social and search stuff in general. Um, have you ever seen any unique uses or platforms that you could use that aren't as, uh, frankly expensive as like user testing, which is multiple thousands a year? Um, hmm. 
I don't know anything about user testing, but I will uh. say that uh, there are some apps that are coming along. There, there are some platforms where basically you could throw a whole bunch of user, let's say customer interviews, maybe. Mm -hmm. Let's say you have 100 customer interviews. And you can put them all into this one platform. And with AI and some other things, they'll be able to kind of pick out keywords. They'll be able to oh, source interesting. them. And, you know, so I, I think that that might be something that I would look into. Uh, I think there's an app called Dovetail that does this. Uh, I'm not super familiar with this space, but uh, that would be something that I would do is just to kind of take conversations and try to find trends that are happening in those conversations. From uh, video. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Huh. That's interesting. Um, that's going to be a little different than like your heat maps or whatever. Or like, uh, you know, I'm, again, I'm not exactly sure exactly like how, what your version of user testing looks like, but I would think that uh, a very simple way to do this and maybe not the most scalable would be to just do short interviews with customers, with clients. Um, and then, yeah, you'd be able to have all those transcripts that would be searchable, shareable. You get insights that way. Yeah. So user testing, I love user testing. Don't get me wrong. It's just pricey. Um, but they, you give them prompts, they recruit people based on your demographic and then they record, they are trained to talk out loud. So they pick people that are good at doing that. And when they, you can have them go from search to your website, which is the part I, that I like the best, but you prompt them with various questions. So this is your scenario. How would you look for it in Google? What result would mm. you click on? And then once you click on it, you're like, why did you click on this website? What did you like about this website? And they literally talk out loud related to all of that. And so you get all this insight. That's every single time I've done it. It's shocking. <laughs> like what wow. you, you searched so that for it is that synchronous way? like someone is there with yeah them it's asynchronous definitely do it mm -hmm. yeah. yep because they get paid obviously and it, they can sure. do it whenever they want um but usually it's really insightful so it's not their face but it is audio plus a screen share and it's very persuasive when you're pretty sure that people are having trouble with a piece of your website and you just want users to demonstrate that but you could certainly do it with social as well because you can throw any thing at them that's on screen, right? And record anything. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I was just kind of curious because I've always found it really persuasive, but like I said, user testing is pricey. Um, yeah. How many, on a, on a typical project, how many user tests would you do? Is it something that's like a handful? Is it dozens? Is it hundreds? Yeah, how, I mean, you only need to do, I think it's eight to 10 to be statistically significant. So it's actually a very small number. That is small, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so I mean, and, and, and like, generating transcripts and, and looking for kind of like, you know, similar words that are being used. Like, is that something that, that then happens or, or, you know, um, well, I have, that, that's new. That's a new strategy that I've heard of. Uh, I, I, I would love to do that. Um, but usually you do get a video afterwards and I forget if you get a transcript, I think you do. Um, user testing in particular lets you just, uh, it's got some editing in it. So, you, you know, once they got stuck sure. on a particular thing, if you wanted to show that to people, they also have service professional services to kind of summarize all this for you, which is also helpful if you're short staffed. Yeah. All right. Um, but yeah, you basically get here are, are the things that users had trouble with. And from my perspective too, you get, these are the keywords they were looking for that you had no clue <laughs> that were things you should focus on. Right. Um, yeah, but oftentimes people use it because they're, they, they're either trying to test out a new design, maybe because you can do it that way too, or you've already redesigned. You think there's some problems. So you want to get some user feedback. Anyway, I think everybody should do it. Um, I'm just curious about tools. And that absolutely seems like something that you could pull off by yourself. Like maybe before three, four or five years ago, you really needed to like reach out to that firm that like was able to do the screen recording and they had a whole process. But it sounds like just based on your description of it, like anybody could do that. You know, you could maybe identifying the, the people is, is the hardest part, but, yeah. um, once you, once you find them, it's, it should be pretty straightforward to be able to walk them through stuff, ask questions, and then be able to re go back to that video, that transcript and, and kind of fix things and make decisions. Yeah. I honestly think the things. hardest part is just making sure your questions aren't leading. That's the part mm, that requires the most okay. thought, but once you've like nailed the questions, then yeah. yeah. In this new zoom world, as long as you've got participant on the other end that can talk out loud. I, I don't understand why people aren't doing more of it. I mean, it is, it does require time, but the insights are huge. Um, That's great. so talk a little bit more about the video platforms and events in particular. I want to come back to, you were talking about an interface where you're at the networking part of a conference and you can hover over and see what the person's like and whether or not you think you have something in common. 
only because I've participated in a few over the last year or two, and they seem very awkward. I haven't really, um, I think hop in was okay, but I don't think that people were really engaging. And then I, I participated in another one that literally has sort of a layout of avatars and you're supposed to click mm. and talk and no way, even as an extrovert, I was like, I don't know how to start. <laughs> So which yeah. ones have you seen that were good? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think Hopin's pretty cool. Um, I just hosted an event um, that we did on run the world. Um, if you've heard of that one. Yeah. And so basically I wanted to have a panel discussion format with some of the people that I interviewed in the book. And so I found someone to host it who um, has a podcast and is, is in the remote work world. And, uh, and it was really fun. So we had, we opened it up and everybody kind of jumped on stage. You can pass the mic and, uh, share the mic and have people kind of introduce themselves, ask questions, you can run polls. And so we had this hour long discussion. And at the end of it, we had that one to one speed networking feature built in. So mm. we, we, we kind of explained everything right at the top, like, hey, we're going to do all this kind of stuff. We had a couple giveaways there. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to send a couple books to people. Um, and then I, I met some really cool people in the one to one chat that happened afterwards. And so obviously, like, that's something that you couldn't replicate on zoom, like you have breakout rooms and things like that. Um, but this was just like a little lighter, a little more fun. Um, and uh, along the lines of lighter, a little more fun, another platform I really like is called gather. Uh, the URL is gather.town and gather is like zoom meets Pokemon or Zelda or something. So when you first arrive, you choose your avatar and it's all in its eight bit glory. <laughs> and then you walk around a map that looks like a Pokemon or Zelda. Um, and so the example I used in the book is, uh, think about like a, like an academic session, like a poster session or something like that. Um, so if you're familiar, so people at academic conferences, they present their research in the form of a poster. So it's like a big room and there's just like hundreds of posters. And so the idea is you go to the poster room and you get to walk around, you get to see like what everybody's working on. You get to talk to the authors, things like that. How would you do that in zoom? Would you send out? A zoom link for each poster would you group people together and kind of go round robin like none of it would be a great experience but in gather it's really natural you just use your arrow keys and you walk around to the different in the poster room right and so um i interviewed someone from gather for the book and he was telling me the story where someone goes to the poster session to uh, like knows exactly what poster they want to read and, and talk to the author and as soon as she shows up who does she see her college professor that you know she hadn't seen in a while who's also at that same poster because he's interested in the topic mm -hmm. and so now you've created that serendipity which is one of the things that people always kind of complain about it's like this lack of serendipity and so um i just thought that was super cool it's a very fun platform and of course you can just customize the heck out of it you can do whatever you want um building this virtual room a lot of schools have started to just recreate their campuses in huh. gather like in the metaverse and so you think about things like office hours you think about things like um uh, lectures, right? Like think about like a lecture hall where uh, you want to do a, a small groups, right? People just move to the side of the room and then the professor can just kind of walk around the room. And then if something happens in, in a corner, he can just turn on a button that addresses everybody and just says, Hey, there's a question that came up in group C over here. I just wanted to mention blah, blah, blah. Okay. Back to your small groups. And then he continues to walk around. So uh, I think adding that spatial layer is cool when it's done right. And it's not goofy and over the top, you know? Um, and I think, I think gathers one way we're to do it where it's pretty light and fun and it, and it is using a format that everyone's familiar with, with video games. Some of these 3d ones where you're kind of first person, uh, are just a little disorienting where you're not really sure like how it's going or anything. But again, like, you know, if it looks like a game boy, everybody kind of understands the mechanics of that. I like the idea of having like spots on the map that are topical too. So like you do yeah. run into people that around the same topic, the, the one that I went to that I thought was really awkward. They literally created, I don't know. It's kind of like the lobby of a conference, right? Where mm -hmm. back to the going up to the people that look lonely, just envision that, but, but digital, right. Where everybody's like lurking, <laughs> they grab their donuts and they're just hanging around the edges, right. That kind of thing. That's what it was, but virtual. And I was supposed to like, go talk to somebody <laughs> anyway, did not work. <laughs> I'm going to mm. have to check out gather. That looks much more interesting. Um, so what other industries other than the ones that you um, mentioned in your book, you think are getting disrupted by video? I'm kind of curious. Um, some people have been using video for a while, obviously. Hello, YouTube's been around for a long time. Um, but I'm, I'm personally very uh, amused by industries that are just now starting to think about doing video. 
which ones do you think are really going to have to uh, more rapidly adopt video? I mean, I feel like everybody kind of has rapidly adopted video. Um, well, with varying I, successes, I, I guess. <laughs> it's yeah, the part yeah of that, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I mean, I think any anyone that has any kind of customer interaction, I think that there's opportunities to do more video. So, like, when I think about, like, finance, for for instance, you know, um, I think that there, there might be some opportunity there for people to deliver more, like, explainer videos and, like, how different features work works like walkthroughs of, of different things. Um, there might be more of like a customer service element to it. There might be more of uh, the kind of like I mentioned, like those kind of personal videos um, like Bonjoro. Um, I, I think the, the one thing that, that, that jumps in that just uh, I just thought of was, was finance where, you know, you just don't really see a whole lot, but I think that um, there might be some, some opportunities to delight customers a little bit better with some uses of video. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so thank you for being on the podcast. I've got a couple standard questions. I ask everybody who's been on the show. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the, the one bit is that you could probably got a feel for based on the questions. Um, I'm a bit obsessed about your target customer and the user. Cause I think a lot of times that gets missed, um, in working with your clients, was there anything that you got recently that was sort of an aha about the end user that the client maybe was not aware of that some of your work kind of surfaced? end user um i'll be honest it's a little hard because it's like we just finish a video and kind of pass it off and then we're yeah. not really sure you know where it goes like we kind of have an idea of like we're going to put it on this page we're going to play it at this event or anything like that um i guess i can kind of share you know i don't know if it's like exactly like aha or what but um you know when we're putting together videos especially ones that are going to be played at events and especially for nonprofits, you know we're really going after those heartstrings right we really want to deliver an impactful message using interviews from clients, from volunteers, from customers, whoever it might be, um, and put together a narrative using multiple voices from people inside the company, outside the company, geographic diversity, uh, racial diversity. Like we just want to be able to show everybody who's involved with this organization and how much it means to them. Um, because that turns into donations. And I think that, um, using video that way, that's kind of a deliberate, uh, way that you can, D the donations, like that's obviously very measurable. Uh, and so I think that that's one way that, that people could be using video for sure. You totally reminded me. I used to volunteer at make a wish events, uh, big okay. fundraising galas. Yeah. And they always had a video and I, there's no way I could make it through without crying, you know? Right. It's just, yeah. Especially at make a wish, the type of stuff they do anyway. Um, so what's the, uh, do you have any additional wins or resources? Cause you've just shared a ton throughout the entire interview and we will list them all in the show notes, but is there any other one you were thinking of sharing that you haven't talked about already? Um, yeah, so I, one I can share is, uh, I'm working with a, a company, they produce events. So they're always looking for, you know, how can we, what are these platforms that we can be hosting things on? Like, how can we be doing things better for virtual and hybrid events? And one of the things I talked to them about in, in this idea of becoming a video first business is you should be putting videos in your proposals. So instead of just sending PDFs, I have a platform I use called bid sketch. There's another one called proposify. There are a couple of these. And, uh, basically, so instead of sending that PDF, you send that prospect to a web page where you can embed videos right into the proposal. Uh, and so if you had a couple videos that were maybe a little bit more polished that were kind of like about your company or about your products or services that were reusable, that's one kind of video that you can put into that proposal. But then you could also do one that's very specific, like, Hey, company, I'm sending this proposal to, um, you know, thought a lot about our conversation and, you know, we, we thought about X, Y, Z, maybe there's a, a little bit of a, an opportunity there for some slides or something like that. Um, you can maybe kind of explain how the proposal is laid out so that they can know what they're looking at ahead of time. Uh, and again, these are just embedded right into that proposal. So I think that that is another really cool use of video that people should be thinking about. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. I remember when I worked at my big agencies days, we used to, uh, seriously hole up in a conference room for multiple days to practice for some of these proposal pitches, but it was face to face. So I kind of wonder yeah. what they're doing now, right? Uh, zoom horribly or, <laughs> right. you know, a, a prepared video would definitely be more effective. I would assume than 
And even if you Zoom. do it on Zoom, right, you just like, hey, I, we're going to show a video right now about the service or the yeah. product or the team or whatever. And you just like hit play. Everyone gets a breather, get a swig of water. Now I'll come back and you're live. And so having, you, you know, when you're, that, that person you're pitching to, that prospect, that's really engaging for them. Like they don't really know what's coming next. It's not just another 30, 40, 50 slide deck that they have to sit through. Um, you know, you're, you're kind of throwing different looks at them and, and doing some things synchronously, some things asynchronously. Uh, I think it's really compelling that way. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so how can people learn more about you? Definitely. So, um, I think the best way would just be to go to my website at patrick.video. Uh, if you go to patrick.video slash hello, um, you can sign up for my newsletter and I'll send you a couple chapters of the book you can check out. Um, and I send a newsletter a couple times a month, uh, just about different trends and in, in platforms that I'm testing out. So you can, uh, learn more that way. Great. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. This is an amazing amount of information. Our listeners are going to be so excited. Um, and I promise all of it will be in the show notes, all of the different resources you shared. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for having me. This was awesome. 